you need it. So uh, the topic today is natural product of redox modulators and the th therapeutic perspective. And, and this is a big topic. I mean, this is very, we've got two very exciting um, speakers. Um, uh, there'll be a short introduction. I use the word short uh, very carefully when it comes to Alistair, um, who will uh, give us an overview of um, some key aspects and concepts uh, which we'll cover literally from the beginning of life to practical medicinal compounds. And, and at the center of this is the question that's exploring the relationship between quantum mechanics, thermodynamics and biology give us any greater insight than we already have when it comes to processes like aging and of course uh, medicine. And throughout the, 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 the topic, and I'm really looking forward to this for Alistair, is going to try to join all these, the following dots, entropy, electrons uh, chasing off, thermodynamics, alkaline, hydrothermal vents, proton gradient, UV light, light as a dissipative uh, negotrophic construct, bacteria, rust, inflammation, mitochondria, his beloved whole missus. Finally, optimal health and, of course, aging, which is another form of entropy. And with that, he will try to explain all these concepts of how plant uh, compounds actually have become medicines or have developed uh, to eventually uh, become medicines. But the whole setting of this is, of course, inflammation. And, and I think that if you, I, you ask 10 different scientists or clinicians what inflammation is, I think you'll come out with uh, 10 different definitions, or maybe even more. Um, the, the simplest uh, old way of thinking of inflammation is simply setting in fire, which is hopefully what Alistair will do for us when it comes to actually this, this lecture. Um, to, to, to get away from the classical way of looking at inflammation, I don't want to spend too much time uh, discussing this because I want to give Alistair all the time and room to, to do this, but uh, we could think of inflammation as a system that has evolved to maintain homeostasis of a complex structure. And, clo uh, and chronic inflammation, which is key in the process of aging, can be viewed as a decrease on, of efficacy of a feedback mechanism. But when you drill down to the very essence of what inflammation is, or even life for that matter, you'll be thinking about chasing electrons. And this, this function of a, of a system that loses the flow of electrons uh, can lead to some serious consequences. And it is here where the in intersection between quantum biology and medicine appears to be uh, more likely to, to occur than anywhere else. Uh, and it's interesting that our second speaker will hopefully be giving us some examples mm -hmm. of some practical uh, uses um, of natural compounds that deal with inflammation, but also that may require uh, some sort of quantum explanation for, for its function. So as you can see, these are big subjects, um, which I'm sure will actually lead to lots and lots of discussions. So uh, I now introduce the, the first speaker, which is Alistair Nunn. Many of you already know him, Professor Alistair Nunn who is the Chief Scientific Officer for the Guy Foundation, and also a visiting professor at the University of Westminster. And Alistair have had uh, an interest in science. And I use the word science with a big S because I think he, like Jeff, is one of those uh, scientists who do not limit themselves to one specific area, not because they don't have a focus mind, because they see the connection between different uh, areas of research and application. And uh, it's become very clear that through his own work and reading and theoretical thinking, um, that to understand some of even the simplest processes, especially when it comes to um, biological compounds or, or rather plant compounds, 
you really need to have a, a full understanding that takes us all the way back to the beginnings of life, uh, to moving away from the classical models of the simple um, lock and key uh, when it comes to activating uh, receptors. So without more ado, I hope Alistair haven't actually built so much the, uh, the, the main uh, star of the show. Uh, I'll pass it over to Alistair. Alistair, tell us all about it. As Jimmy explained, we're, we're obviously trying to link um, kind of theory ideas more towards translational science, which um, Wolfgang will, will come into. Um, from, from my perspective, what I'm going to try and do is link two kind of ideas together, um, which we've kind of discussed and looked at for a very long time. And this is the uh, what we call the dissipator hypothesis. Sorry, Jimmy and Jeffrey, I've just made that up. Um, <laughs> But it was based on one of our one of our earlier papers, um, and link it back to the idea of the origins of life and thermodynamics, um, and and uh, and link this back to an idea where we've looked at uh, inflammation from the kind of concept of uh, of thermodynamics. So I'll just briefly go over what we mean by inflammaging. Um, this is a quite an old idea, and effectively it discusses the relationship between inflammatory tone and the aging process and the observations that as we age we tend to increase our inflammatory tone and uh, this is quite an old idea and uh, this paper was one of the first papers that really discussed it discussed it uh, was by Franceschi and what they suggest is that with age our ability to adapt to stress slowly decreases and certainly you can see this uh, they've, they've looked through the concept of immunosenescence. This is where the immune system starts to age and can't quite do its job as well. Um, and what they're pointing to is as you age, this process, your ability to adjust, your robustness decreases, and this is, results in an increase in inflammation. And there are lots of papers on this, but it certainly seems to make quite a lot of sense. And of course, central to all of this is our little friend, the electron. Um, so, um, the other day I was in the shower and I was trying to think how I'd put position this. And sorry, sorry about the kitten. It's the only thing I could find in clip art, which was close enough. Um, but the thought is, if life is a dissipative process, and by this, the, the, one of the best theories about the origins of life is, is to do with this far from equilibrium, self-organizing, dis, dissipating structure, which seems to be um, uh, described by thermodynamics. Um, it follows that we must apply this idea to medicine. And so if life is a dissipative process, what do we mean uh, for it in relation to a definition of health? Well, actually, and this is what we do with Jimmy uh, and Jimmy's group is try and understand what we mean by optimal health. And actually it's one of these areas, everybody discusses disease, but not everybody discusses what health actually is. And sorry, Jimmy, I haven't quite come up with the all encompassing definition just yet, but one definition certainly is the ability of an organism to uh, maximize its health span within its defined lifespan. And this means being as healthy as you can for as long as possible. And that this, for instance, can be measured quite well for us in particular about, for instance, our ability to walk if we're not injured, but actually walk. And as we age, we slowly get slower and slower and slower. And there are all sorts of tests which measure this and it's related to fragility. Um, so this is quite well understood. So, is disease related to an inability to maintain dissipation if we're talking about dissipation as being a, a fundamental principle in life? And is healthy about the ability to maintain it? So thus, is there a relationship between dissipation and inflammation? And just this little bit here, I've shown um, obviously from birth to one of the oldest people that described the world, Jean Clement, she lived about 120, 122. And one of the key things about healthy aging um, or the health span is of course, being able to keep and live a very good healthy lifestyle, move around, do everything you want to do for as long as possible. And with healthy aging, most people will suffer something called uh, morbidity compression. That is an organism will live very healthily, well do everything it can until very close to the end when everything goes wrong and it dies. Unfortunately, in a modern lifestyle, what we're seeing is the opposite. We're getting, we're getting a, a morbidity ex uh, expansion where people live less long, uh, in health in their lives but spend much more time in ill health and interestingly in uh, the, the recent studies have shown in centenarians and these are folk who live a very long time and well even to their hundreds um because this, this is a big focus of looking at the aging process they seem to have a better ability to control their inflammation 
And, and it, this is even seen in their offspring and their grandchildren. So this is telling us something. Okay, to the more complex bit. Um, we wanted to look at inflammation from a thermodynamic perspective. Um, and we've also been looking at life from this concept of hormesis. Now, those of you familiar with our work will understand when we talk about hormesis, but hormesis is this biological phenomenon where a low dose of stress induces an adaptive response. Uh, and a high dose obviously has the opposite. In effect, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And it's a really old idea. It's been around for thousands of years, but it's only been given the name in the last 50 or 60 years. And it's essential for evolution because without stress, you wouldn't adapt. There's nothing to adapt to. So evolution couldn't have happened in a calm little pond. It needed lots of nasty things like lightning and all sorts of things, dissipation of energy gradients. And, and when evolution got going, of course, predators and everything else. Then if we look at the in biological terms, inflammation from this concept, we can argue that, well, inflammation is simply that process which enables an organism to rebuild itself if it's damaged. Um, and of course, it therefore, thereby encompasses hormesis. And interestingly, from a thermodynamic perspective, it potentially describes how a dismutive system um, attempts to restore itself, perhaps by resorting to simpler structures. And there's some math behind this. I won't go into this because I don't fully understand it, but it's like, it's, it's a subject called adaptive thermodynamics. But the other interesting thing about all of this is that actually damaged systems must be removed because they can damage systems which are fit. And it seems that through biology, certainly this process has been adopted right from the word go. That is uh, through this process of called programmed program cell death. So death becomes this, it's really important and it could be described from a dissipative process. And so really what we're looking at here is a hormesis and inflammation and part of the same adaptive process. So, of course, I'll, I'll point out this is this is a theory from uh, from our, our end. Now, there's another interesting thing that that comes out of this um, is that the scale you look at could be really important. Of course, everybody you know in medicine will look tell you inflammation is about it's the you know if you're damaged you get this red area in your skin, you get the wheels, you get the heat, and this is where the term inflammation comes from. It's literally, generation of the heat. But of course, if you look at it from a global perspective, this is actually, it tells you something slightly different. And this is not a new idea. Of course, this goes into the ideas of Lovelock and the Gare hypothesis, but even such notables as Morowitz, who, who, who's one of the gurus and origins of life. And he talks about life being the fourth geosphere, i.e. life as a product of, a, of the planetary scale, which of course means that if we're looking at dissipation, it's almost scale invariant that actually natural selection and removal of systems goes from the literally one molecule all the way up to entire species, um, which is gonna, which is potentially, of course, makes us feel quite insignificant and small. And what I've tried to do with this diagram here, and I do apologize, um, it's probably a bit complex, I got carried away with it. But what I'm trying to show is that, of course, at some point in the past, say 14 billion years ago, there was a big bang, if that's the theory, and there may be other theories out there which can be used. But this came, this resulted in the formation of atoms, eventually complex, more complex molecules, and eventually protein-like structures, which began to extract and use the energy, say, for instance, available in a, in a, in a uh, thermal vent, leading to more and more complex structures, until eventually there was this kind of self-perpetuating dissipative structure, for instance, um, involving biochemistry of various chemicals, for instance, shown by this, the TCA cycle, or tricarboxylic cycle, acid cycle, and electron transport, which enable the dissipation of energy. And this is just like a, you know, a, a self-forming negotropic structure. And eventually, of course, we then got into uh, prokaryotes. And so this, this could have happened, and what's interesting here, very soon after the Earth cooled, uh, the suggestions are that life could be at least almost 14 billion years old, and even perhaps even older. So life got going really quickly. And it seems that this dissipation was driving this process and self-organization. And I've skipped a big gap here, but what next ha happened next was, of course, we formed the eukaryotes came into being, and we ended up with various orders of life, of course, plants, uh, dinosaurs, and mammals. We know what happened to the dinosaurs. They got wiped out a bit, although a few of them left. So, of course, we ended up with chickens and birds. But, of course, mammals did very well out of this process uh, following the, 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 the asteroid hitting. And, of course, we ended up with animals like dolphins. And then we ended up, ended up with people people and us. And of course, people have the great, great capacity now to reset the entire thing starting back zero again. So I won't go into that too much in the current situation, but I'm sure you can work out what I'm talking about. This is all very canticle for Leibowitz, for those of you out there into science fiction. Anyway, moving on. Um, 
one of the things we've always been very interested in as a group is is trying to explain why it is uh, that modern lifestyle seems to have resulted in a lot of self-induced disease and by this we're looking at things like obesity diabetes and everything and what we've come to the conclusion of is that actually this is something which is uh, almost an intelligence paradox and we've used this idea as a kind of a parable to try and say well look this is what happens to intelligence especially mankind and we applied this as a, as a way of looking at this uh, to Fermi's paradox. And you'll see the, the, the reason for this in a minute. Um, I think most of you will know have heard of Enrico Fermi. He was supposedly uh, a, to have said to a colleague of his in the 40s and 50s um, when they were discussing aliens. Now, of course, you may think, oh, what's this got to do with everything? Well, this was at a time when the universe was being discovered very quickly. We realized that, you know, we were a part of a very big galaxy. There were other galaxies out there. Were billions of stars, billions of planets, many of them much older. And so Enrico apparently turned to his friend and said, well, if there is older cultures out there and we know that technology can be developed quite quickly, where are they? Why are we on our own? Why, why haven't we seen the aliens yet? Now, this, you know, this may be the stuff of science fiction, but it's a very, very serious question about are we alone? And actually it raises far more questions than we can answer at the moment. And so we use this idea to, to invoke the fat alien concept and the, the relation to entropy is quite interesting here because what we're saying is that as life evolves it evolves under stress and therefore it adapts and adapts and it seems to be able to take on more and more and more information become more and more complex and as it does so one of the things that life wants to do of course is remove the stress and and then we get to a certain point for instance and we, we talk about aliens here but this is equally applicable to humans is that we get to a point where we develop technology and with this technology we can remove virtually all the stress and actually this is behind we think why we're at this stage now where we live a very comfortable lifestyle but well many people can not everybody on the planet can but certainly for a lot of western countries we've removed the need for to be cold or hot we've removed the need to walk around we we have unlimited food and when you start to look at this of course this takes away one of the prime drivers of this dissipated uh, adaptive process and it could suggest if you start thinking about information um, is that of course we don't need to store information in our heads anymore and certainly one of the things which is very controversial but well described in the literature is that when you go up this curve and you start falling down the other side and you develop conditions associated with over, you know with not moving around and, and, and the diet high in calories is you develop um, increasing inflammatory tone and this of course is back to inflammatory aging but of course we know inflammation affects the brain in a negative way. So you have this rather interesting thing where we start to get to this pivot, and do we go down the other side? And does, does society get less smart? Um, now, if we take this from the entropy idea, of course, you think, oh, well, is this the end of everything? Well, no, it isn't, because of course, as we develop technology, we can use far more energy. We can, we can change high energy to low energy order entropy and accelerate the heat death of the universe. And of course, this chap here, you know, when he evolved, of course, was just one alien power. But when we get up here, you know, he can have a vehicle, he can have a car, he can have a rocket, and he's using thousands, million fold times the amount of energy that a single organism can use. So beyond this, and this is not the discussion we're going through today, but of course, what happens after this? And this is another discussion for another time. But anyway, the key point here is that by decreasing environmental hormesis, we increase inflammatory tone. This is our idea, by the way. Not everybody would agree that other ideas are available. But an interesting thing, of course, is we take this about from the information point of view, inflammation, if we're talking about it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a system or a, a process to enable rebuilding, of course, it requires information and it requires information about the prior state. And when we talk about genes, of course, there's all this idea that genes hold the blueprints, but they develop structures, which are called things like proteins, but they encode a whole system which can use energy. And this is where we got really interested in this, because, of course, this is this comes back to Mike Levine's work and, and, the, and morphogenetic fields. And, of course, the movement of charge in our systems generates this field. And this could be another way that information is held. In case we're not going to go too much because it's been discussed before. But when we talk about uh, Jan's work and the electromagnetic fields and everything, this begins to make a lot more sense. Because, of course, one of the things that the ability to rebuild in inflammation, it requires the information. But it requires replication and it requires cooperation. And when you look at the immune system, one of the things our immune systems are very good at is determining self from non-self. 
And this is another way of looking at that. Of course, if you get cancer, one of the things is our body goes, we've got cancer, let's get rid of it. But when you're infected, the same thing happens. But it seems as we get older, that ability decreases and it could be related to inflammation. But this, this, is, this, this could be very, very old because again, People have often thought that, well, prokaryotes, you know, bugs and bacteria, things, oh, they, single, they're, they live a single life and that's all they do is compete. And, but they don't. Evidence is that prokaryotes and bacteria and things have been cooperating ever since life began. So cooperation may be far more important than we thought. And in particular, the more components you have, the more information can potentially be held. Again, we're not going to go into this, but it suggests that cooperation is, is a, a response to a kind of stress. And maybe hormesis could be part of this. And if you think from the cancer perspective, of course, this begins to make some sense. So just quickly moving on to looking at more colloquial, what we descriptions of disease. What is disease? Disease simply means dis-ease, opposite of ease. It's, uh, it's, it's characterized a lot of homeostasis, either locally or in the entire organism. We become less robust, we become increasingly fragile. Uh, we become incapacitated. We have a reduced fitness to survive. And these are all concepts which we see in aging. Um, but of course, it seems to be associated with reduced optimal health. So can we sort of can summarize this? Well, in a way we can. Chronic disease and aging seems to be related to a loss of flexibility, hormetic flexibility. And this isn't a new idea. This adaptive idea has been around a long time. And certainly we get more disease as we age. And if you look at aging, of course, it happens in every species, but it depends which species you are. It seems that lifespan has been uh, evolved to fit a certain niche. And, and part of that process is about maintaining the soma, which is the body, which can potentially carry the germline, versus replication and ad adaptation. And certainly for most species, it seems that calorie excess accelerates this process, but it can be slowed down by calorie restriction. So there's an energy component here, energy information component. And it's associated with all sorts of things in disease. I mean, if you look at the aging process, we get mitochondrial dysfunction, increased inflammation, of course, is what we're interested in. You get epigenetic changes, and this is above DNA, and this is control of DNA by, by acylation and methylation. Well, we can measure this now. You can take a sample from people and show that their metabolic age could be a lot higher than their actual chronological age and vice versa. And this is what they're finding indeed with this. Of course, it's, it's also associated with mutation. As we age, we accrue more and more mutations. But the interesting thing here, if you flip this on its head, we can live a long time with a huge amount of mutation, accrued mutations, but we we maintain our homeostasis. So what's going on there? This could hark back a little bit to the idea of Mike Levine and electric field again. We have this failing proteostasis. We can't remove damaged components. And this is actually quite, this is one of the fundamentals of the aging process. We can't renew either. It's, these two are linked. And certainly there are very clear pathways involved in this, suggesting some kind of adaptive component, certainly things like insulin resistant insulin pathway, factor, transcription factors like FOXO and uh, things like mTOR involved in this. And of course, death eventually comes, and you know, this is the entropic explanation, eventually we lose all our hormone tickets uh, in flex, of, of flexibility and dying. Now, of course, you know, in this in this group, we're talking about we're very interested in quantum effects. And again, I think this is pretty much everybody's on board with this one. Um, this would suggest and we this is an idea we before we really got into this, we started looking at this and realized there's so much information out there on potential quantum effects in biology. But one of the things that comes out of this, of course, is if you have a loss of structure, does this mean we lose the ability to, for instance, use significant quantum effects? And does this mean that we start to lose the ability to dissipate? And so does our quantum underground fail? And so of course, this might relate straight back to saying, well, actually, as we age, our structures start to degrade, we can't dissipate, but this could be related to maintenance of particular quantum things like be able to tunnel electrons for efficient leave, of course, which leads to inflammation. So there's this nice crossover here. Okay, so that's the quantum bit done. Sorry, now I'll move on to the electrons because it's part of the same thing. Um, in terms of redox, of course, we're thinking about the electron. And of course, uh, as one of the very famous quotes from, from Albert was, of course, life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. And certainly in respiration, which is this ability for organisms to turn food into water effectively, using uh, as an electron except of our oxygen, if it goes all the way through complex four and you get maximum energy extraction, but of course, if the electron doesn't make it there, where else does it go? Well, actually it goes all sorts of places, but it's fundamentally an adaptive signaling process. It can increase, indicate damage. It can indicate we need to die. It can indicate we need to grow. 
And there are all sorts of things that go on, and it could be said head dependent on quantum tunneling. And I always put this little picture in here, which is um, it's a picture I took of a, of a cell. It's, a, it's a, what we call a mouse B104 cell. And this shows mitochondria, and this is using a mitochondrial dye. But I think the point I quite like to say, there's a lot of structure here. This whole mitochondrial system is reticulated. You've got a lot of activity around the, around the nucleus. And there are some cells, I haven't got a picture of one of them, but where this whole system is entirely connected. So there's a lot of connection and cooperation going on here. And when it fails, they all tend to break up. So that's, that's another possibility. Just a brief thing on redox and catalysm. I think most of you will be very familiar with redox oxidation. Of course, redox is a contraction of redox oxidation, fundamental movement of electrons. Uh, an atom or a compound becomes uh, reduced, it gains electron, oxidized, it loses it. And certainly in life, it's all about the movement from more electropositive compounds, atoms, all the way down to more electronegative ones. And energy can be extracted in this process. Um, and this is just as a classic example of this, you know, sugar molecule, how much energy can be extracted. But one of, the, one of the key components of this process in all life, of course, is, is a molecules like NAD and FAD. Now, I'll come back to these because they have some very interesting properties uh, because these are electron carriers. So just to kind of summarize this a little bit, um, if we look at mitochondria, they actually have far more roles than um, many people realize. And I know they're not the only things in a cell, but they are quite an important one. And certainly from our food, if electron can go all the way down to water, we get lots of ATP. But of course, if it doesn't make it there, for instance, there's if it's hypoxic, you run out of oxygen or it's damaged or other events, the pH changes, the temperature, all sorts of things can happen. The electrons start to come out in different places. And this, of course, induces adaptation. And in particular, for instance, it can induce antioxidant activity, uh, autophagy, removing the damaged components and eventually more mitochondria or, and or, it can induce inflammation. Of course, the electron doesn't necessarily have to come from the mitochondria, it can come from other pathways like NOx, but this activates the immune system. And of course, it can also be used, for instance, in, through, through say, let's say, neutrophils in directly killing bacteria. So it has a multifunction. But of course, the other thing it also does, it can say that this structure needs to die. And this is basically induces cell death. And as we now know, <laughs> There are multiple forms of programmed cell death. Uh, when I started, apoptosis was the one I worked on, and it was really the main one everybody knew about. And this process is actually quite interesting because what it actually happens is a cell dies, but it dies in a very neat and tidy way. It's a very careful form of tidy suicide. And the reason that nobody discovered this process for a long, long time is, of course, when you look at a body and a, a some tissues, you never see the process. And so, of course, it really caused a problem with trying to work out how immunity works, which is a natural selective process. But when Kerr and Wiley first actually realized and discovered this, they showed that billions of cells a day die like this. They die from apoptosis and they're neatly taken up by all their surrounding cells. They get eaten by their fellows, basically. So you don't see it. It's non-inflammatory. It's very, and it potentially is an antioxidant process. Anti it reduces oxidation. But we now know that there are many forms of this process. And one of the ones which, of course, is quite relevant, for instance, to the current COVID pandemic, of course, is paroptosis. Cells die very violently. And this is actually controlled to induce inflammation. And if that's not controlled, you get a nasty, vicious cycle. But they also die by necrosis, which turns out is actually controlled in several forms. Necrosis originally was just simply thought the cell dies because it's been you know, dropped in boiling water. But actually, there are carefully controlled versions. So there's probably seven or eight, nine different ways cells can die. Then, of course, electrons can go in other places. Um, for instance, they can go to glycolysis, the alternate electron acceptors. Um, and if electrons go, in, they can also go back into the TCA cycle and come out again as part of growth. And so there's nice, the, the, the mitochondria is controlling all of these things. But another process which perhaps is less appreciated is that, of course, in the mitochondria, one, there's something really interesting going on. And this is that a lot of the energy which is going in here is uncoupled from the, pro the proton gradient, which from the electrons generate, allows protons to go back and short circuit. This generates heat and actually uses up a lot of energy. But it's not just protons, or a lot of ions do this. It's, a, it's called futile cycling. And the cell is full of this. 20 to 30% in some cells of the energy is it's apparently wasted. But of course, from our point of view, this is, a, this is a nice dissipative process. It's a bit like leaving your engine ticking over in a car. It keeps it ready for action. And of course, if you think from the dissipative process, this is very, very good because this is what life is doing. Obviously, through evolution, it's had to control it a bit, but it's still going on. 
And of course, key components of this, one of the key outcomes is this process of, can be very strongly antioxidant because it enables the, the, the using up of energy to prevent these ejection of electrons in different places. And when you start looking at the bigger picture here, here you have the movement of electrons, but all of these processes, of course, also have feedback mechanisms to prevent excess electron movement in the wrong places and, and, and the development of antioxidant systems. Now, I'll just throw in this because this actually does help with inflammation. And this is the idea that um, apoptosis itself is controlled and has evolved in certain ways. And there is such a thing called the apoptotic threshold. And it seems, and again, there's evidence building on this, that shorter lived animals have a higher apoptotic threshold. And this is because it enables, if, if apoptosis was very, very sensitive, it means that when you try and build a new organism through, you know, after, after conception and the, the egg and sperm get together, that process is highly naturally selective and most don't make it. And one of the things that happens is if a cell, when it's made and after conception, is unfit, it kills itself. And so you never know it's there. But if you slightly increase the threshold of apoptosis, you can have more surviving embryos, which is great, but um, it comes with a, a series of problems. One of which is you have slightly less efficient mitochondria. You need to have more anti powerful antioxidant systems. And this is common to uh, shorter lived animals. And it suggests that, of course, this process has evolved to be adaptive in the sense that it course you change it, you change the speech, you change the individuals very quickly to adapt to changing, say, for, for instance, temperatures or circumstances. So individual turnover can lead to increased rates of cancer, uh, but it's effectively a form of dissipation by replication, which again is quite well described. But then if we look at the opposite end of the spectrum, there are longer lived animals and they show something quite interesting. Their mitochondria are a lot more efficient. But what this means is they tend to have less surviving offspring. And they tend to also have less powerful antioxidant systems, which of course, when you look at the free radical theory of aging, is almost counterproductive. But of course you don't need them if your systems are already very efficient in controlling electrons. And this suggests that this is a, a, an evolutionary process to be adapted by our intelligence and certainly in birds flight, um, it's certainly associated with less cancer. And so it's, in, it's like a dissipation of individual robustness. And if we look at which animals in particular are, are, are show these characteristics, a rat for instance lives a very short time and there was a theory for a long time that it actually there was called the rate of living theory, which is the more energy you burn, the shorter you live because your mitochondria producing far too many ROS, and therefore you have a short lifespan. Well, of course, this is completely untrue. <laughs> you can have a same a bird with the same weight as a rat, and it lives a lot longer, and it gets through a lot more energy than a rat ever will. <laughs> so like, biology has found ways of improving longevity of individual dissipative structures like a bird. And of course, when we look at other animals like an elephants and things, this, this process seems to be going on. So we can manipulate this system, or the evolution has manipulated this system. Okay, so um, what I'm going to try and do here is just go through some very simple diagrams. Um, uh, what I want to show here is I'm trying to do this, and I do excuse, and please excuse me for <laughs> this diagram. But what I'm trying to show here is what happens with inflammation in a very simple way. Um, if we have inflammation, we have production of uh, basically free radicals. This is electrons going in the wrong place. And to begin with, if damage generates a signal, there's a feedback system, which is a positive feedback, amplifies the signal. You get damaged, you want to amplify the signal very quickly to induce a, an, a response to try and remove whatever is causing the problem. This is also, uh, at the same time, there's also a negative feedback system. And this, of course, has uh, certainly in the body has a lot to do with the generation of antioxidants, um, maybe turning over the damaged organelles. So eventually this blocks this system, the reactive oxygen decreases, the signal to peace, and that's inflammation resolved. So this is a, it becomes an anti-inflammatory process, inflammation becomes self-resolving. Now, if we look at chronic system, we get the same system, but what seems to happen, certainly as we age, the adaptive system doesn't seem to be quite as good. And part of that may be, and this is that we don't produce enough antioxidants or we can't get out of this cycle. And so what you end up with is a weaker system. And of course, this means that the, the reactive oxygen continues to be produced, which induces damage. And so you have a negative spiral. And of course, this is kind of underlines uh, what's happening in inflammation. So I'll just, here we go. So now, how can we combat this? Well, one of the favorite medicines now um, is exercise. And uh, it's been known about a long time, but now people can even realize it's one of the most powerful ways 
to improve your optimal health. It's not the only one, but it's one of the most effective. And the reasons for this become quite apparent when you look at this. Exercise, so all of you who have done any exercise, been for a run, you'll get muscle soreness. This is inflammation. Exercise is inflammatory to begin with. But of course, what happens is, is the system has a very powerful negative feedback system. And it very quickly upregulates antioxidants and an ability to regenerate or remove damaged components. So within a very short time, the damage is replaced and the system functions. But in the longer term, what actually happens is, of course, you get the same system, but you get then get, but this happens, and probably this happens in all cells, but in you know, muscle, this is particularly obvious, is you increase your metabolic flexibility, you increase your ability to control and flow electrons because obviously you want to produce more energy and capture more energy. And this enables you actually then to control this a bit better. So this is what we call metabolic reserve. I mean, this is a very simple way, but there are other things that Jimmy will say, there are lots of other things involved, but this is a simple way of looking at it because it's all about being able to flow electrons. And so you can produce more ATP and you can exercise longer and harder. And the key component here is, of course, and this is the real, this, this is what's happening nowadays. We're now realizing, of course, muscle is in communication with everything else in the body. So your, your guts, your, your fat tissue, your liver, and certainly your heart. And it's not just metabolites, there are also other signaling molecules. It's, it's, uh, but in particular, the brain as well, because this entire system, for you, to, for instance, to exercise and run, requires an immense amount of computing power. You think about the coordination required when you go running. <laughs> this little thing here has to really work pretty hard and it has to get all the, and the, seat, the feedback has to be very good. So when you exercise, it isn't just the muscle, everything else has to adapt. And this is fundamental to, to how we, how why, one of the reasons why exercise seems to be very good because it, it, in the long run, the right amount of exercise is clearly anti-inflammatory and slows down the inflammatory, or seems to slow down the inflammation process. Um, just the implication of electron flow. Um, as I was saying, too many electrons could be bad. I won't want to go into too much of that, but the point I'm trying to make here, it increases your capacity for metabolic engine. Um, and those of you will recognize that as a Traban, that was those you recognize as the 2016 Red Bull. But anyway, basically increases your metabolic engine, increases your capacity to do stuff. Now, from this, when we talk about information, we also think about information, information and inflammation. And there's a rather interesting concept comes out of this. If we don't exercise, is thinking itself a hormetic exercise? Does it induce adaptation? Well, you could argue it could. Um, we all know that if we think hard, and there's all this evidence that maybe, for instance, to, to, to reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's, making making folk really work through problems can actually be quite beneficial, getting them engaged. And of course, this is making the brain work like a muscle in a way. And you could argue the same process is going on here is it, it, it induces uh, an adaptive response. And I won't go into too many details about why this is going. But one of the key ways of looking at this, of course, is, is through um, the ability to take on information. And so in a, in a minimal situation, you've got electron flow, energy coming from your food, goes to protons, generates an ability to store bits. And this is the dissipative structure we call life, the negative entropic structures, taking on board information, experiencing entropy. If we stimulate it, the argument can be made that this, of course, enhances the ability to store memory and store information. So the same process we're doing, this is causes a hormesis again. Now, <laughs> there's an interesting point here. Hormesis suggests that too much thinking is damaging. Now, and of course, I think many people who've been, you know, done their exams and things, and many teenagers will say this is a bad process, <laughs> have to work hard. But of course, what we do know is that certainly a lack of sleep can very quickly affect the how well your brain works, but also inflammation. And we know that inflammation can, can certainly slow this process down. So there's quite an interesting thing here about how all of this ties together and whether information itself is, is a, a, a means to incur more information. That's a, a subject for another time. Um, so in a way, to summarize this bit, we're just saying inflammation and the mitochondrion are very closely related and there are all sorts of things we can associate with this process ranging from proteostasis, uh, accumulation mutations, salt and telomeres. They're not the only thing, but they're part of this process through epigenetics 
and senescence, which of course, if he will be looking at, is, is, is key in this. And actually, we know that exercise, for instance, can reduce the senescence. This is the buildup of, of functional cells, but they become quite inflamed and they just sit there in a the tissue and don't do anything. They just become inflammatory. But we know things like exercise can actually calorie restrict and start to remove, as can many compounds, uh, but we won't go into that today. But basically, it's about the ability to flow electrons safely. And this could be, and if they fail, this could be a sign of a failing dispersive structure, which brings it back to thermodynamics. Anyway, onto the more, onto the more, uh, the, uh, stuff about how we may use this obviously exercise is one way of doing it but what else can we do well how can we practically apply this and this is where our where we've been going for several years on thinking about this i apologize for this slide straight away this this is what we call the dissipator hypothesis at the beginnings of life we had a planet uh, we had lots of things going on with interstellar chemistry the chemistry on on the land in geothermal vents on the sea um, this is Haldane's primordial soup, those of you who recognise this idea of Haldane's original ideas. But what we do know, of course, this gave rise to a whole mix of prebiotic chemicals. And these were chemicals which arose through natural chemistry. And a lot of these ones, interestingly, are actually chromophoric. And this is the fact that they, and this describes their ability to absorb light uh, and dissipate the energy from light. But it also means, because of their structures, and all of you recognise the, the double bonded structures here, that it, of course, means that they can also act in redox too. And through time, um, and we're not exactly sure how it happened, but we ended up with a system which became self-dissipating, which was organised, which involved these chemicals. And through repeated cycles of, of cold and light, of heat and, sorry, heat and cold and heat, light and dark, we probably ended up with some some kind of, of, of informational store molecule, a polymer like RNA or DNA. And with time through something called the cycle of beryllium, this led to information storage. And because we had information storage, we could have natural selection acting. It went from a pre like a prebiotic natural selection to biological natural selection. And then we ended up with what we would recognize as life to the life, the prokaryotic life. This continued because this life continued. Now, this is where it gets quite interesting because these, these life forms were full of these chromophoric molecules, but light was still very, very important. It was a real stressor. And, and on early Earth, one of, the, one of the origins of life theories talks about UV light being very important because this induces natural selection. And we know a lot of uh, pro prokaryotic uh, cells, they have their own sunscreens. And funnily enough, a lot of these sunscreens that Skytamine and Microsporin are also antibiotic. Hmm, tells you something about evolution. And with time, we ended up with something called an alpha protobacterium. This became the precursor to mitochondria. And then we had cyanobacteria. These became the precursor to chloroplasts. And then we had the archaean, which is a different kingdom of life. These two got together. The archaean came to the outside of the cell. The mitochondria came the inside. We have eukaryote. And this is when life really, you know, this, this probably happened one, one and a half billion years ago. We don't exactly know when it happened. It may have happened earlier, but there's evidence, but it's difficult to get evidence. But the key point here is this life contained a lot of molecules which are, have the ability to absorb photons and dissipate energy, but they also be became critical in the stress response. As you can see, the stress started right up here somewhere, but life has built on this ability to use these molecular structures. And so, of course, if we now fast forward a bit, what we now have in today's world uh, are all these chemicals. And these, these are a, a natural products. They're secondary plant, plant metabolites. And the theory goes, and I think there's a lot of support for this, that these compounds originally evolved in very early organisms and indeed early land plants as sunscreens. And one of their, one of their functions was to dissipate, for instance, excess UV. And all of these compounds are fluorescent or have, can, can be made fluorescent. But what's interesting about all of these compounds, they are also integral to the plant stress response. And for all of these compounds can also uh, modulate mitochondrial function. And all of these compounds are known to be bioactive. Um, resveratrol, you'll probably be familiar with. This is the, the apparently the, the, the darling anti-aging anti compound, which you find in red grapes. Um, things like uh, curcumin, which is found in turmeric, which is, you know, has a lot of uh, the, 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 the uh, Natural product, love, love this. 
But all of these, including cannabidiol and tetrahydrin cannabidiol, which we're particularly interested in, also have this function. But one of them in particular, salicyclic acid. Um, this is a key plant hormone. And of course, you know it better as aspirin. <laughs> so this is telling us something. But they all have this, this is a Jablonski diagram, they all have this ability to absorb light and be evolved in redox. Now, let's go back to evolution again. I mentioned this thing, mentioned these compounds earlier on, NADH and FAD. Now, these are central to life. These are electron transport, they're electron carriers, they're essential in virtually all, all form organisms. But they have this very interesting property. They are fluorescent. They absorb light. And in particular, NADH and FAD+, you can use these to image mitochondria. And um, indeed, this has been done many times. And this is this picture here is, is what you can see using the NADH fluorescence. And NADH is predominantly located in mitochondria. That should tell you something. But and this is what this is uh, the same same cells uh, um, uh, with mitochondria dye. When you merge the two, we can see the same thing. But if you look at the the absorption spectrum of NADH, it could make a very good sunscreen. But when you start digging into the literature, you start to see some very interesting things. DNA, now everybody thinks oh, UV is really bad for DNA. Well, it probably is, but it's also a very good sunscreen. <laughs> Bacteria use it and may have been using it for millions of billions of years. If you have a colony of bacteria, and most bacteria will live in a colony, and if they're exposed to sunlight, lots of them will die for the greater good and they release DNA. And this, this actually acts as a sunscreen. Back to salicylic acid. I don't know how many of you know this. Of course, it's key in the plant stress response. It's also actually an uncoupling agent, which is, again, which could be telling us something. It's also a key component in many commercial sunscreens. If you con conjugate it to fatty acids, it's part of a key sunscreen. So we've been using this unknowingly for years and years and years as a key sunscreen. So uh, how do natural products work? Well, um, again, if you take the evolutionary aspect, um, and then look at it from the pharmacological, pharmacological perspective, you'll see a lot of these compounds, they show what they call compound promiscuity or multi-target activity. So in pharmacological terms, each of these compounds binds to many, many, many things in the cell. And of course, this can be quite confusing in trying to work out how they work. But if you switch it on its head, stand it on its head, the ancestors of these compounds, indeed some of these compounds, were around from very, very early in evolution. So biology has become more complex around them and adopted their function. So you can see why now they probably will affect many different pathways because when, they, when life started, it was all much simpler. And we know many of them might affect mitochondria. And what is interesting about all those compounds I showed you before, um, not only are they anti-inflammatory and potentially antioxidant, but they're all anti-cancer and have anti-pathogen activity. How can a single simple compound do all of these things? You know, how can it do all of these things? Well, of course, if you start thinking about the dissipation idea, it begins to make a little bit of sense because a low dose, for instance, if they modulate mitochondrial function, this is just a, an example using calcium. We know a lot of these compounds modulate calcium and calcium, of course, is a key uh, signaling molecule in cells. And we know they modulate, mitochondria, uh, modulate calcium. And we know, for instance, if they allow calcium into a cell, it can go into the mitochondria, this activates the mitochondria, generates frost, generates an adaptive response. If you keep increasing the concentration to a point, and I put here, what's this, this is uh, mitochondrial permeability transition, you get to a point where, of course, it starts to damage mitochondria, the mitochondria get very ill and, and start, and potentially can even induce apoptosis. But of course, if you think about this from the anti-inflammatory thing, this induces metabolic reprogramming and can be anti-inflammatory. If you think about it from the cancer perspective, it's actually quite interesting because of course, one of the things about cancer is that it, the cells seem to uh, redirect calcium away from mitochondria. Um, this seems to be something very common and this controls apoptosis. But if you have a compound which can redirect calcium back to mitochondria, suddenly you have an anti-cancer mechanism. And of course, plants also get cancer. So think about what these things are doing in plants. So this is, you know, this tells you, it tells you a great deal. But when you get up to much higher concentrations, you start looking at something quite interesting, of course, if dissipation is important and you can, for instance, uncouple, dissipate, uncouple say the proton gradient, you start having a potent antibacterial mechanism. And indeed there's evidence now that although we have conventional antibiotics like penicillin and they disrupt, say, cell walls, there is also evidence a lot of these compounds also disrupt the proteome gradient or electron transport. So you start to see how one compound can have many actions, but a lot of them can be related to dyspin. 
dissipation. And of course, a rather interesting thing that comes out of this, of course, if you're altering the energy flow and the charge flow through a cell, of course, you're altering its potential informational boundary and, and back to the, the ideas of, you know, of charge being critical in, in cell structure and, and back to the ideas that Jan was talking about last week and Mike Levine and regeneration. And um, nearly at the end, um, we kind of looked at this from, from, an interesting, from, from another perspective and just kind of makes the point that actually we can look at two things at once. Um, and thanks to Reese for putting Reese for doing this work. Um, we looked at cannabidiol and mitochondrial structure and redox, but we used did this, and thanks to Stan as well, um, by using lifetime imaging. And again, we mentioned NADH, and NADH absorbs and re emits light, and you can see it through autofluorescence. And these are the key molecule. And if you look at this, if we study this system, what we've done is, is look at uh, cells using two photon microscopy, which enables us to look at the lifetime decay. And we've shown there's indeed a change in the way the NADH uh, may be bound. And this seems to correlate with increasing concentrations of uh, cannabidiol. And certainly this correlates very well with changes in mitochondrial structure. And this, these are conventional uh, mitotracker dyes, but we can see we've seen a change uh, in the structure of the mitochondrial response to this. So this tells us something about the whole, whole system, the way it's altering its calcium flow, its structure and everything. And we've seen this many times, and many, we've done this many times with different dyes and things. So in a sense, how can we summarize this? Well, if we talk about the, the, the promiscuous molecule, and we'll, I'll, we use CBD here because of course, this is one we really understand very well. It binds to many things in the cell. And you know, when you look at the literature, there are many different variations in how it's working. The consensus is it's clearly anti-inflammatory. Many people are now looking at it as an anti-cancer agent. Um, it certainly seems to have some anti-pathogen activity and it also, for instance, alters extracellular vesicles, which we've also looked at, but we haven't got time to go into that. But if you look at some of its targets, um, the, the literature support seems to support some of these. Um, it's some, some authors have shown it binds the electron transport chain. Of course, if you alter the electron transport chain, you immediately generate, or potentially have the potential to generate ROS. You change the electron flow. One of the earliest papers that came out in 2013 was the suggestion it binds to this thing called VDAC1, which is the voltage dependent anion channel one. And this is a, this is, this is a very, very key um, protein structure on the outer membrane of the mitochondria. It controls all sorts of things from metabolites going in and out of the mitochondria to calcium flow, uh, to apoptosis um, and, uh, and glycolysis. It also binds to, tr to trip V1, we, th we think, and certainly there's evidence it binds to other ion channels. But of course, as soon as you start altering the ion channels, you alter this whole system, as I showed you before. And so, of course, here we have, we could have an echo of a very early dissipative modulation, which comes from you know, billions of years ago, altering these various structures. And it suggests that dissipation could be part of how this process is, it, it becomes adaptive. And just to nearly there, just to finish, what we're trying to say here is, in effect, if we look at life as this a kind of a dissipative structure, you have limited high energy electrons going in and the lower ones coming out, you get dissipation. This is a, you know, the far from equilibrium structure, self-organizing structure. If you have lots of energy coming through, uh, there are entropic reasons and thermodynamic reasons why this structure could then replicate, because of course it would lose its internal order, so it forces it to go down this one. This is what we might call reproduction. If we have a damaged structure for whatever reasons or high energy electrons, there is this inflammatory system which, which tries to rebuild the structure. And of course, if the damage is too bad, we see that through evolution, it seems to have evolved this ability uh, for cells to commit suicide. And this is very, very ancient. Prokaryotes, I mean, you won't, bacteria commit suicide. This is something which has been discovered in the last 20 years. So this self-removal uh, self system goes back a very long way probably four billion years. And of course, if you don't have enough, then the system stops working as well. Um, interestingly, of course, there are animals which we, we, we've already discussed, uh, like tardigrades, which of course can survive with very low energy. And this is an interesting area, which we're not entirely sure how it all works yet. So just to finish the replies, if life is a dissipative process, it follows that we must apply this principle to medicine and by learning how to manipulate a key player in this process, the electron to maintain and restore dissipate homeostasis. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank Jimmy and his team, Reese, uh, Stan and Alistair, who <laughs> helped put all this together, and particularly Jeffrey supporting this and allowing us to discuss all these really fascinating ideas. So thank you very much.
uh, Wolfgang um, trained as a medical doctor in Germany and Cambridge, mm -hmm. rather interesting uh, combination in the early 80s. Uh, then did a PhD in neurobiology uh, at the Max Planck Institute, uh, and then as a postdoc again at the Max Planck Institute. I think he has had an extremely successful career uh, in, uh, in taking basic science into the commercial arena and set up uh, some uh, rather fascinating uh, companies, uh, Biognostic, Antisense Pharma, and you, even Biomedium, which are actually quite interesting in electronic data management. And currently, uh, Wolfgang is the founder and chief executive, executive officer uh, of Metri Farm. Um, he, following his study and uh, you know, gaining over 30 years of uh, biotech industry, he's now leading a, a fascinating, uh, I, I guess I think it's a fascinating uh, a company in looking at uh, uh, chronic and, uh, and acute inflammation and taking a completely different approach to the, the whole problem of inflammation. And for a long time, uh, most of the people dealing with inflammation were trying to basically dump in, not dump it down, but basically cancel inflammation altogether. And it has been shown that that actually is quite detrimental, especially when it comes to cancer, that if you remove all inflammation, if anything, it makes uh, cancer cells grow even faster. And I think Wolfgang will tell us a, a, a novel approach, which I think is very exciting of what he's doing at the moment. Uh, Wolfgang, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, let me share my screen and, um, okay. So I hope you can see that now. Yes. Okay. So yeah, let me, um, first of all, uh, I think it's, it's a fascinating, for me, fascinating uh, a series uh, here. Um, I'm just a very humble, uh, medical doctor, so uh, some of the concepts here go far above my sort of intellectual waterline, but um, I'm trying to keep up, but a lot of interesting concepts. And also I must uh, confess that I completely missed um, the, the central sort of topic of, of this session because it's about natural products, and I'm going to talk to you about a completely unnatural compound. Uh, but which has interesting properties that might tie into, into this whole um, uh, area. And what I'm, this will be sort of from a very practical uh, uh, point of view, just giving you some examples of, of how such a sort of how redox remodeling uh, uh, can work and what, what it can sort of have uh, as therapeutic effects. So let's go right into this. I mean, this is um, redundant, but um, sort of the, the central theme that, that we uh, look at is oxidative stress, which is sort of a, a cellular response, uh, reactive oxygen species sort of uh, go up. And that's uh, as, as many here and, and Alistair has, has shown, it's uh, sort of the overspill sometimes often from, from mitochondria, from, from uh, uh, the mitochondrial function, function uh, and uh, reactive oxygen species and, and oxidative stress then are a sort of a very upstream um, signaling mechanism um, involved in, in triggering a lot of other downstream um, uh, systems, senescent cells, mitochondrial dysfunction, kinase function, cytokines, all of these basically in, in, in these gray boxes are more or less classical pharmaceutical targets in, in um, anti-inflammation. Most recently, kinases, uh, jack kinases, uh, et cetera, and, and anti-cytokine um, antibodies like anti-TNFs, et cetera, have been the big craze. But again, these, these are not really regulatory approaches of, in pharmacology, but you, so you basically try to knock out um, in sort of an over- uh, activated system, but rather than down modulating it, you're trying to knock it out completely. And that, of course, has a whole uh, uh, um, tale of, of, of other problems. And, and um, usually these anti-inflammatory drugs are immunosuppressive. 
the question is really, do you want to imp uh, uh, suppress the immune system? Um, and then sort of going down, if you look at, at different, uh, and this is only a small selection of, of diseases that sort of are uh, now very well understood that, that they are triggered uh, by chronic inflammatory responses, by oxidative stress. If you look at chronic diseases auto, uh, and autoimmune diseases, osteoarthritis, psoriasis, uh, Crohn's colitis, these, these autoimmune diseases, asthma, COPD, uh, um, uh, non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatosis, NASH, uh, diabetes, also the, basically the, the um, sort of the, the demise of, of, uh, uh, of, of islet cells, uh, CVD, uh, atherosclerosis. It's very clear now that, uh, of course, this is much less a, a, a hypercholesterol, but that in, in, uh, intima in inflammation that sort of gives the ground for, for the, the, the buildup of plaques. And then uh, virtually all neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, uh, ALS, Alzheimer's are chronic inflammatory diseases and, and coupled to oxidative stress long before they become clinically um, sort of apparent. And then there is also something that that surprised us here when working with this. This also this mechanism is very much involved in um, uh, acute indications, infections, be it viral or bacterial. And I'll show you some some uh, things in that direction. So, and when we go on, of course, uh, uh, this sort of the 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 life and health sort of curve that we have is. That uh, as with increasing the age, we're sort of the uh, health is um, um, deteriorating, as as uh, Alistair also beautifully explained, and that's sort of the energy production goes down with age. Ross, uh, as a consequence, oxidative stress goes up, and we have continuing sort of a groundswell of inflammation, which causes organ damage and basically a vicious cycle that leads to. Um, uh, sort of to, to the aging process, or at least um, uh, uh, um, uh, fuels the aging process. And something that, that also came here in, in an earlier talk that uh, um, was uh, that mitochondrial function or efficacy of energy production uh, is, is sort of the capacity is going down as we age. So it's about 20 75% of our full capacity around age 50, I've read, and then goes down to about 50% when we're around 75 years of age. So basically, our uh, capacity to, to, to deal with stress with, uh, and, and, and repair, et cetera, goes down. So, and, and not surprisingly, um, the organs that are most vulnerable to oxidative stress and are the, the, the organs um, that that have to maintain a lot of um, gradients. So that they they have to have a lot of energy to to maintain the gradients, of course, in the brain and nervous system, uh, to um, uh, the, the sodium and and, and calcium gradients uh, 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 to uh, and and potassium gradients uh, to to for signaling in the heart. In the lungs, which is also very much exposed, of course, to oxygen uh, directly. Um, the liver is, is, of course, a very productive um, organ. Uh, the pancreas and the kidneys also, basically, they have to pump out or they have to filter out and, and regain the, the, the ions that, that, that are filtered out. So a lot of gradient upkeeping work. And basically, these are some of the diseases that, uh, that, that um, sort of ensue uh, uh, from this. Uh, and those, those are really the most vulnerable organs where we have to deal with these kinds of, of chronic inflammatory diseases that are very much also coupled to the energy metabolism, which is so far widely ignored by, by standard medicine. Um, and if we look at oxidative stress and the redox balance uh, within the cell, uh, long term or long time, people have thought, well, you have uh, uh, oxidative stress or so a high amount of reactive oxygen species, and that's bad. And the best thing is to kill this off completely and, and completely scavenge all ROS uh, until 
um, not too long ago, one has started to realize that uh, reactive oxygen species also have a, a, a crucial role in cell signaling and to, um, to completely annihilate uh, ROS is, is a bad idea. And there's sort of one very sort of key clinical study that was done with uh, smokers um, treated uh, with high doses of a natural antioxidant um, with, with beta carotene. And to the surprise of everyone, the, the people that, that got a lot of high doses of antioxidants had a high, higher um, incidence of lung cancer than the ones that, that the, they were all smokers, um, than the ones that didn't get the antioxidants. So that sort of really discredited for a long time antioxidants saying, well, they don't, they don't have any health effect uh, and uh, it's complete bogus. But I think the, the key here, and that's a key that, again, is very sort of little understood in, in, in at least in pharmacology or taken to heart, is that we need balance. And um, if, if we try to sort of rebalance the, 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 two, um, the two approaches are some low doses of natural antioxidants, which usually are not enough to really um, rebalance redox state in, in diseases, uh, or we have high potent, uh, either high dose or, or uh, um, uh, synthetic antioxidants that usually then, then overkill the whole thing and, and sort of uh, 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 eradicate all ROS, which again then leads to uh, disrupted cell signaling and is also not, uh, 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 not beneficial. And uh, uh, this is just a quote from a large EU, EU funded um, project that included, uh, um, I think 50 labs from 31 countries, 151 researchers looking at uh, sort of at the um, medical opportunities in, in, in antioxidative or ROS uh, scavenging and ROS balancing um, uh, therapies. And basically the, the final conclusion here in the blue box was that it has an exciting potential, but the, 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 the challenge is really to target only the damaging effects of ROS and leave the healthy effects uh, untouched, which again means this balance. And this is pharmacologically, that's, this is extremely hard to, uh, to achieve just by dosing, et cetera, because uh, um, you have, within the body, you have areas of oxidative stress, let's say when you have a, uh, an, a localized inflammation, but you have other tissues where you don't, uh, or where, where uh, ROS scavenging can be in a healthy tissue, uh, can be detrimental. So this is, has been, really been a conundrum that, that is, is still sort of open for, for, for uh, invention or debate. And the, uh, the, the, the molecule that, that we work with uh, and that we, we are developing clinically is a very old substance. It's uh, luminol, um, which is a, a chemo um, luminescent reagent uh, used uh, in, in a lot of lab work as a reporter molecule, uh, albeit it's not really bioavailable. Um, it's, it's an unstable molecule and um, we've developed a, a stable crystalline form that, that is uh, um, druggable. And the basic mechanism here is that this is sort of the basic structure of, of luminol. It's, it's um, basically an inactive, if you, if you um, give it to an, an organism or a cell, it's more or less inactive at normal sort of ROS, physiological ROS levels. Um, when, when you have it's a cell or a tissue that has that experiences oxidative stress, the high um, concentration of reactive oxygen species um, deprotonates the the the, or, uh, the the neutral form of of luminol, um, activates the molecule, and it becomes an a, a an electron donor, and then sort of it turns around and scavenges uh, excess ROS by donating an electron to these species. So basically the drug we are giving, this is just a carrier, our, our core drug is electrons. And they are electrons that are sort of um, transferred um, or triggered, the transfer is triggered by oxidative stress. So it, it only becomes active 
in, in inflamed tissues. And when this, when this, in this reaction, there is also, uh, that's why it's a chemiluminescent reagent, there is a photon emission in the blue light spectrum. And once the, the, uh, the molecule is consumed and inactive again, and is just excreted uh, via the, the urine and the feces. And other than these functions, what we found is that this molecule doesn't really bind to any receptor. It's basically completely inert um, other than this, this action. And the way um, we've shown this, uh, um, this, this sort of targeted action only where there's oxidative stress and, and inflammation is in this experiment here um, where uh, we have induced with, with a substance called uh, LPS, polyliposaccharides, um, um, a localized inflammation in a knee joint of a hind leg of, of, of a mouse. Um, and so we knew there's basically that's where the inflammation is. There was also palpable and, and uh, could be seen from the outside. Then the animals were injected with the drug. Uh, and we know from radioactive labeling that the drug distributes within uh, within minutes, more or less, through all the tissues. So the drug is everywhere in the animal, and there's just the inflammation. And then we scanned these animals in, in a completely dark chamber with the ultra high sensitivity photon counting camera. And what you can see here then is the signal, that's the photon emission from this process, from this electron donation process uh, of, the, of the drug, which is everywhere in the animal. But you can see the drug only becomes active where there's active inflammation. And everywhere else, it's sort of, it doesn't do anything, which then also uh, contributes to a, 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 a extremely good safety profile. We haven't seen any adverse events or toxicity with this drug, even at extremely high doses. And what you cannot see here, actually, there was a, a minuscule signal also on the contralateral side, where we just for control reasons injected a little bit of uh, uh, um, physiological saline. And at the point of injection, you have a micro, uh, because of the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the damage of the needle, you have also a, a tiny bit of inflammation and that was also picked up. So what does that uh, mean clinically? Um, uh, basically, when we look at sort of at activated macrophages, which are the, one of the cell types that mediate in, in a tissue when there's inflammation or damage, uh, mediate the inflammatory response by producing, amongst others, uh, a, a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And you can stimulate um, macrophages by um, lipopolysaccharides, which are surface molecules from gram-negative bacteria. That's how they, they uh, activate inflammation. And when we look here at a whole panel of well-known pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-1, beta, IL-6, IL-12, IL-23, um, the gray bars here are the, um, the, the maximum output of pro, the, the respective pro-inflammatory cytokines set to 100 uh, of activated macrophages. And when we treat these with, with this drug or with this compound, what you can see is a down modulation of these pro-inflammatory cytokines across the board by about 40 to 60 percent. And I think that's really important that we, we don't completely suppress the expression of, of these cytokines because they have a physiological function. And drugs, modern drugs like, like uh, antibodies that completely knock out certain of these uh, um, uh, cytokines like TNF-alpha, very uh, one of the, so the world's biggest selling drug is, is an antibody against uh, TNF-alpha, it's Humira. But this then makes these uh, patients immunocompromised. They, they are uh, susceptible to opportunistic infections. Um, so basically you're, you're buying your, your sort of inflammatory uh, uh, inhibition with, with immunosuppression, which has a lot of other consequences. Um, this is an example of using this, this principle or this, this compound in a model of, of arthritis. It's uh, uh, um, uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis called collagen-induced arthritis. Basically, what you see here 
um, uh, these, these animals are immunized with a, with a compound uh, with a cocktail of collagen. They they become sort of autoimmune autoimmunized against collagen, develop an arthritis just like rheumatoid arthritis. And the score that you can go up here is is a uh, um, a clinical score that just measures how many how much inflammation you have in the different joints. And you can see that uh, with increasing um, doses of of this compound the inflammation goes down. And most importantly, this, these are um, histological sections through the, the, the knee joints of, of these animals. Um, and what you can see here is in, 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 in placebo and in vehicle, you see a completely a lot of inflammation and, and uh, infiltration, and the, the joint structure is more or less destroyed, even at the lower um, uh, um, here at the lower dose and at the optimal dose, what you can see, you only not have any inflammation, but you have a com complete um, preservation of joint morphology. This is the, the, the to the, the tumor and, and fibia, uh, uh, the, the uh, basically the joint capsule here with these triangles are the um, uh, well, slip the English word, but basically what you can see here, or even the, the layman can see, this is very clean. Um, uh, uh, um, chondro, uh, um, uh, cartilage sites. Another model is that we use is an, uh, called uh, EAE model that's of multiple scler sclerosis. Again, it's an autoimmune disease you can induce in, in animals. And what's measured here is the sort of the um, the degree of paralysis of the limbs, which is typical of, of also of uh, multiple sclerosis. This goes up um, after the induction of the disease and then stays basically stays, uh, severely inhibited. Lots of paralysis here. And when then when these animals are treated with, again, with this, with this selective Ross scavenger uh, that we're using, um, you can see basically uh, the disease does not develop and it's just as powerful or as potent as dexamethasone, which is a very high powered uh, corticosteroid. Again, of course, with this mechanism, you don't get any of the side effects of corticosteroids. And uh, one of the results that, that was really surprising to us uh, uh, of controlling uh, oxidative stress and, and rebalancing redox is the effect on uh, an infection. And this is a uh, an experiment with uh, systemic um, infection by Streptococcus pyogenes, a, 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 a bacterium. And what we can see here with these animals that they basically they have a sepsis, they have a severe uh, in a, a systemic infection. By again by giving this 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 compound, that's what we was the original intent is to control. The, the rise of pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-6, because these animals, or in this disease, you typically get a cytokine storm that everybody knows now from COVID, and controlling these cytokines was, was the clinical goal. But what completely surprised us that when we looked also at the bacterial load in the blood and in the liver, that this compound also had a dramatic effect of reducing bacterial growth or bacterial load in, in these animals. And that is kind of counterintuitive because the, the general um, sort of uh, uh, theory goes that uh, um, especially neutrophils produce high amounts of reactive oxygen species in an infection to kill off the bacteria. Here we have reduced the, the amount of, of reactive oxygen species and had a very dramatic effect on, um, on bacterial load. We've, we've tested this compound on 24 in, 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 in Petri dishes on the effect of 24 pathogenic strains of bacteria and has no effect on bacteriostatic effect whatsoever. So it's a purely immune mediated effect by reducing the, the ROS or redox re disbalance in an infection in immune cells, you can sort of control the infection, and that is absolutely um, agnostic to, and, and, uh, to to the type of bacterium or pathogen. And we've done that also with MRSA with a number of, of very 
uh, a multi uh, uh, multiple drug resistant bacteria and this um, mechanism works with uh, no matter what what kind of bacterial strain you have and uh, this is also uh, we've looked at that in, in the survival of, of uh, these highly infected animals that usually have a sepsis and usually um, uh, th this is a model where these these animals were treated with the standard drug uh, that is used in sepsis uh, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic, uh, meropinim, uh, and with basically with with giving this antibiotic very early on at high doses, you have a usually a survival between 50 and 60 percent, and that's the survival rate we have in in um, in sepsis, uh, in septic shock in humans uh, nowadays. Uh, it's so high, very high mortality. Uh, and if we add to that antibiotic, uh, this Ross scavenger, we get a survival of 100%. And not only do these animals survive the 10-day critical period, but uh, when you look at the, um, at the clinical score, how, how well these animals are, um, you can see this is the, the higher up this Gonad score goes, the, the sort of the more disease symptoms these animals still have. So even the animals in the, in the, uh, that survived uh, with the, only with the antibiotic are still severely ill um, at, at the end of this 10-day period, whereas when we, do, when we add the redox balancing to, these, to the therapy, the animals were basically undistinguishable from non-infected uh, animals after three, day three. So the people in the because it was a double-blinded experiment, they said, well, we know exactly which, uh, which animals have gotten the drug and which not, because they knew when the animals got well so, uh, so quickly. And uh, to, to sum it up, we've also looked at, uh, at SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and what we've seen, and these are in, uh, viral uh, replication assays in, in lung epithelial cells, and what you can see here, there's a nice dose-dependent effect in, in, in inhibiting viral replication by ROS or by redox rebalancing in, in, in these epithelial cells. And that works basically beautiful with all the different variants um, uh, of, uh, um, of, of SARS-CoV-2 and as a uh, control we had here, remdesivir, which is more potent. So this is... Uh, Rebalancing redox is not the most potent um, therapeutic approach, but it's very broadband. It's it's basically has what we've seen. We have no side effect profile and can be, I think, ideally then um, combined with other classical drugs or with natural compounds to attack potentially chronic and acute uh, inflammatory diseases. And of course. Um, controlling um, uh, oxidative stress and, and um, sort of chronic basic inflammation um, then can allow us uh, to, to, to sort of eliminate the, 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 this sort of um, low dose or, or low grade inflammation that causes aging and allows hopefully to expand the health span um, and, and counter many of the, uh, um, of the effects of aging. Of course, we are, we are not aiming at primarily at expanding lifespan, but expanding the health span. So basically the motto is you don't live longer, but you die healthier. So that's, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.